In 1872, George Smith, a researcher at the British Museum, was laboriously putting together jigsaw-like pieces of the Babylonian tablets found at Nineveh. One night, Smith came across a large fragment with only one side legible. He was stunned to read the story of a man who built an ark to escape a devastating flood, who brought on board animals of all types, who sent out birds to see if the waters had receded. Smith had stumbled across one chapter of a much longer tale, the Epic of Gilgamesh, inscribed in clay no later than the 17th century BC. He announced his discovery on December 3, 1872, at a meeting of the Society of Biblical Archaeology in London. On reading this and deciphering this, uh, the effect on both the individual who read it and the audience who received the reports was astounding because here, for the first time, was practically verbatim written confirmation that the stories contained in the Bible had a currency outside the Bible. The Epic of Gilgamesh was not the only Mesopotamian flood myth to be uncovered by archaeologists. A second story, the Sumerian, dates to about 1800 BC. A third, the Atrahasis Epic, was etched in clay around 1700 BC, but is actually much, much older. Both of these narratives tell of the world becoming so overpopulated, of human beings becoming so noisy that the gods are unable to sleep. In order to stop the noise, mankind must be destroyed. If you read the story as you read it, it, it passages in Gilgamesh, you didn't tell people where they come from. You say, you know, this is from the Bible. It sounds almost the same. It's very, very striking. In many ways, these Mesopotamian stories uh, are uh, very closely uh, related to the biblical, not only in the general notion of a of a flood, but in some of the particular details. There is a Noah figure. He gathers uh, his family and goes onto an ark. He's on the ark for a period of time while the rest of the world, the human world, drowns. Uh, the ark comes to rest on a mountain. And there are some pretty startling points of comparison between the two, which suggest that they must have uh, commonalities that are not accidental, but share either dependency or a third tradition that may have informed both. The similarities are so close in terms of the, the, the general structure, the episodic structure, the fact that, for example, the birds are sent out to look for land. Um, this, this occurs in both the biblical narrative and the cuneiform narrative. It's, it's impossible for me to conceive of a situation in which these two stories ar arose independently. Now this raises a couple of additional questions. Who had it first? Mesopotamia or the biblical world. What's very clear about these stories from Mesopotamia, especially after Hasis, is that they can be dated very accurately or relatively accurately, in, at least in a couple of their versions, to the early second millennium BC. So there's very little doubt that the Mesopotamian literary tradition, which includes these flood narratives, is much older than the Hebrew one. Here we have the smoking gun. Here we have discovered uh, with the uh, uh, Mesopotamian material, uh, a story which we now know is far, far older than the biblical version. Flood stories hundreds, if not thousands of years older than the Bible? How is this possible? So there is no doubt that these stories are moving around in actual tangible tablets. And so no doubt these Canaanite peoples and uh, later the Israelite peoples um, were aware of the stories as good stories, as um, uh, stories that dealt with fundamental problems. The other possibility for Genesis is that this was a story that came into the Genesis traditions during the exile. When the Jews were uh, living in Babylonia, and there were certainly people among them who were very familiar with near from culture. The existence of not one, but four flood myths in Mesopotamia caused many experts to believe that there must have been a real flood on which the stories were based. But was there a mighty deluge? And can science prove it? <laughs>